you think I should keep the lights off? Can, yeah, try it. Let's see, let's try it. Maybe you can see the thing a little bit more. Well, one of our texts for today was uh, Romans 5, 12 through 19. And you have to remember that the epistle to the Romans was written by Paul towards the latter part of his uh, 30 to 35 year uh, career. And Paul takes all that he's experienced personally, all the knowledge that he's gained, all the stories uh, and words that he could accumulate from the life of Jesus, and he throws it into this, uh, this treatise uh, called the Book of Romans. And most of our Christian theology that we talk about today, the phrases that we use, the terms that we use, the concepts that we talk about as Christians, comes from the Book of Romans. So in many ways, we are Pauline, <laughs> not Christian, you might say. I mean, it's based on Christ, but we have Pauline theology. And in Romans 5, Paul introduces uh, this kind of new concept of where uh, Christ uh, negates his obedience as the perfect Paschal Lamb, negates the disobedience of Adam. So you have the old Adam who is disobedient, and of course all the repercussions of that, Paul says, and now we have, because of Christ, he is the new Adam, through his perfect obedience, uh, nullifies or rectifies uh, all that the old Adam let loose. <laughs> you know, sin, death, and the devil, you might say. The Pandora's box is open. So it's an interesting text. If I can get to it. Oh, I don't have it on. Sorry about that. No? Wrong direction. Wrong direction. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people, because all sinned. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not changed, charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass, for if many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if, we, for if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through the one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in a condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. So that's Paul's talk about Old Adam versus New Adam, Adam versus Christ. And of course we all know that it began in the book of Genesis, the good old Garden of Eden, and the word Eden means uh, perfect harmony um, and beauty. That's what the word Eden means. So it was a place of perfect harmony and beauty because Adam and Eve's will was at that particular time aligned with God's will in a perfect way, you might say. So there was no, they did, so, so sin, death, and the devil did not have power over them at that particular time. But there was a day when God said, do not eat of this particular fruit, that the serpent meandered his way into their lives, and through temptation words, uh, Adam and Eve succumbed to the serpent's words and disobeyed God's command, ate of the apple, and as a result, all hell break loose, you might say. <laughs> Pandora's box was opened, and all of a sudden, Adam and Eve now felt the burden of sin, death, and the devil having power <clears throat> over them. And that's what we share as part of our original sin from Adam and Eve. So uh, they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden and thrust into the world, and the rest is history. But God did not give up on humanity. 
okay? He did not give up on humanity. He decided that he was going to choose a particular race of people. He was going to create this great nation uh, that would become the example of obedience for the rest of the world. That's what God said. I'm going to choose and create a nation of people through their obedience to my commands will show the rest of the world how to overcome the powers of sin, death, and the devil. And of course, it all started with uh, the obedience of Abraham, who left everything that he owned and just went out on faith and ended up in the country that we now call modern-day Israel or Palestine. Just uh, the faith of Abraham. He was the beginning of this chosen nation that would become a light and, a, and an example to the rest of the world by obeying all these commands and showing the rest of the world that somehow the power of sin, death, and the devil does not have total control over us. That's what God's hope was. And Abraham started it all. Okay? Well, just before you start that, of course, then Moses came along and gave us the commands. Isn't that right? Okay. This is where the commands came in on top of Mount Sinai. And this is your classic uh, picture of one of my favorite movies, The Ten Commandments with Charleston Heston. Remember? Oh, my gosh. Talk about special effects back in the day. Yeah. Let's see what it looks like here. This is Exodus 20. If you might remember this. This is kind of cool. special effects. Isn't yeah, that something? That was pretty good for they them. did it pretty good. Yeah. That so that was God's way of saying, here's these commands, and if you do your best to obey them, O chosen nation, you will become an example to the rest of the world of how to overcome all the stuff that was released by the disobedience of, of Adam. And of course, it became evident mm -hmm. that they were not able to do it. Uh, why? Because they had to rely on their own human powers, uh, their natural tendencies to, 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 to be obedient. They didn't have much help from the Holy Spirit, they didn't have a, a new nature, <coughs> they didn't have that gift of faith like we do today, but they tried, but it didn't work out the way God wanted it to work out. And so God finally decided and said, you know what? I've got to go to another plan. <laughs> you know what that plan is. Plan B or plan A or whatever it was. I'm going to go down into the world and I'm going to become the perfectly obedient one through my son to overcome and negate and rectify the disobedience of Adam. He's going to become the new Adam. 
this part of myself. And he is going to be able to, through his work and obedience, uh, to give people the power and ability to overcome uh, and deal with Adam's disobedience. And of course we know that the baby Jesus was born, uh, both human and divine, so he had a natural will as well as a divine will, you might say. And then, uh, you know, we read about his birth in Matthew chapter 1, and then 30 years later, it's, we go right to his baptism, okay? So there's 30 years of Jesus' life uh, that we don't know much about. My personal opinion is that he spent those 30 years working on aligning his natural will with God's will. That was not something that was programmed to do. He, he had to do it on his own. Isn't that amazing? To finally start to align his will with the Father's will. And it started all, he got to the point where he was able to be baptized. That's how close he was to that perfect alignment uh, to, to the point that God said, yes, it's time for you to start your ministry. God the Father said to him, and, and you are my blessed one. Thank you for working these past 30 years to slowly align your will to my will. Thank you, Jesus, my son. You've done great work. And how do we know that this process took place? Well, the only thing that we have a glimpse of during those 30 years of, of uh, time is uh, this particular incident that you might be familiar with. You know, the little boy, Jesus, in the temple? That's the only story we have about those 30 years. The rest goes from birth to baptism. But in Luke, for some reason, the Gospel of Luke has the story of Jesus going as a 12-year-old boy to the Passover feast. You've heard about it. And uh, he slowly feels driven to move away from his parents and the rest of the group from the village, which was a no-no. I mean, you've told your kids, you know, at the mall, when we used to go to malls, isn't that right? Mm -hmm. Stay right next to me, isn't that right? Don't go anywhere, isn't that right? And that's exactly what they told, you know, Jesus as a 12-year-old boy. Stay right next to us. But for some reason, and Passover was a crazy time in Jerusalem. <laughs> you had hundreds of thousands of people from all over the world. And of course, you know... <coughs> Kidnappings took place back then, just like they take place today, for obvious reasons. And that's why they were very careful. But for some reason, the boy Jesus, at the age of 12, which is, you know, a special type of age in the Jewish faith, felt driven to go to the temple. And there he started having conversations with the legal experts, the Pharisees, you know, the great thinkers of that time, and they said that, that they were amazed at his knowledge. Well, of course, you know, he's, he's God. And uh, then his parents, you know, finally find him in the temple after looking for him for about three days. And he's sitting there quietly, and he basically tells, mom, tells them, you know, Mom and Dad, I'm sorry for what happened, but I'm now starting to align my will with the Heavenly Father's will. It's not saying that your will, Mom and Dad, is not important. It's still going to be but I'm in the process now. It says that, basically, you know, my, my father's will is now becoming more important than your will, and, and Mary and Joseph had to accept that. So that was a, a sign in the Gospel of Luke that this process took 30 years to the point that Jesus was able to be baptized. And of course, right after he was baptized, what does it say? The Holy Spirit drove Jesus, where? Into the wilderness, where he faced temptations, three temptations from Satan himself, uh, you know, that, boy, I tell you, must have been very, very <laughs> tough to deal with. And they were basically all temptations that would, uh, where Jesus would use his divine powers for his own benefit. All three temptations were where Jesus would use his divine powers for his own personal benefit, pretty much. That's what the temptations were, you know, to turn rocks into bread and he was hungry to uh, to take all that the world had to offer and encompass it for his own benefit and to jump off the temple as a spectacle and stop just short which he could do you know uh, and everybody would applaud him and lift him up as a hero uh, but he resisted that temptation why because his father's will 
and his will were so in line to that point that he was able to do that based on God's word and his own inner dynamics of making those two wills come together. So he defeated Satan at that particular time. Wow, think about that. Not easy to do. He cast him away out of the wilderness. But that process continued for the next three years as he was doing his ministry. And as you can see throughout the Gospels, there is no sign of Jesus ever doing anything for himself except what? Going and praying to be by himself, isn't that right? So that he could be recharged and reinvigorated by the Heavenly Father himself. But there's no sign of him ever using his divine powers for his own benefit. He was aligning his will with God's will and putting aside his natural inclinations, his natural will, in order to be in line with God's will to become that perfect Paschal Lamb. And of course, the great ending process of this struggle took place in another garden, the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus finally, finally, before the next day where he was going to face, you know, the ultimate test of crucifixion and pain and agony, in the Garden of Eden, Satan's head is finally crushed where Jesus says, finally, not my will, but thy will be done. I'll drink of this cup of suffering that you are giving to me. All the way to the end. And of course, the best depiction that I could find of that uh, comes from, I uh, just meant from uh, Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion. You might have remembered that. It's the Garden of Gethsemane scene. So you've got Garden of, Ge of Eden where the disobedience took place. Now you've got the Garden of Gethsemane where the perfect obedience is finally aligned that negates and rectifies and nullifies that disobedience in another garden called Eden. And, okay, go ahead, push it. This is Jesus speaking in Aramaic. That's Satan. stuff. So that was the final alignment process. Isn't that amazing? The final alignment process that allowed Jesus to finally become the perfect Paschal Lamb sacrifice to totally nullify what took place in the Garden of Eden and finally give us the ability to become children of God in, through, the, through this marvelous gift of sacrifice. So, again, that's what Paul's talking about in this Romans text. Contrast of characters. The first Adam versus Christ, who's the second Adam or the new Adam. One brought sin into the world. The other one gives people victory over sin. Many died because of his sin. Many live because of his grace. His sin results in condemnation. His death results in justification. His disobedience brings sin to many. His obedience brings righteousness to many. His sin reigns in death. His grace reigns to bring eternal life. Isn't that amazing? And that's what Paul's doing there in that one particular text. And I just find that to be fascinating. The fact that now, because of what Christ has done, we now have the ability to have 
a certain power over sin, death, and the devil. I mean, they still infiltrate our, our lives and still impact our lives, but now we have the ability to fight against those and slowly align our will with God's will you know, as our life goes on, which is a never-ending process. Paul says that that struggle continues until the day we die, when we finally divest ourselves of this old Adam completely, and the new Adam, the new nature in us, uh, finally uh, becomes totally us, and we resurrect as that new nature into the heavenly realm. Isn't that amazing what, what Paul talks about? So we have this gift of new life with Christ. And what I find to be fascinating is that uh, because of Jesus Christ, we now have been given the gift of faith to trust in God. It's not something we manufacture on our own, which the people of the Old Testament had to do. We are now given the gift of the Holy Spirit freely and openly, which in the Old Testament was only given to a certain few. Uh, and we now have the gift of a totally new nature. How many times do we say that when you're baptized, you're born again? And that's your totally new nature becoming part of you. And we're called to utilize this new nature and let it become more and more of our lives. The difference between old nature and new nature is, again, old nature worships the unholy trinity of what? Me, myself, and I. The new nature worships the holy trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The old nature feeds on anything this world has to offer. The new nature feeds on what? Bible study, prayer, worship, and fellowship with other Christians. And that's what you and I have to make sure that we're involved in to some extent so that we can continue to feed this new nature. Plus, we have the gift of the Holy Spirit to guide us and lead us and to comfort us. And the new nature, in its own wonderful way, will help us to slowly, over a period of time, align our natural will and push it away and out of the way so that we become more and more, you know, not my will, but thy will be done. Also, the old nature wants nothing to do with the dues of the gospel. Remember that. Yeah. The old nature wants nothing to do with the dues of the gospel where Jesus says, do this for me, do this for me. Um, the new nature is the one that learns to love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself and get out there and do acts of mercy, love, and compassion and forgiveness. Old nature wants nothing to do with that. So this is our calling. Our calling is to live as uh, new natured people, <coughs> saying thank you and giving thanks for what Christ has done for us. The devotionals that I use <coughs> Uh, every day by Sarah Young and these are two books she doesn't sit there and say you have to become perfect people her main emphasis in most of her daily devotions are to have an attitude of gratitude for what God has done for us to give thanks for what he's done for us and to trust in God in everything we say and do on a daily basis through good times and difficult times. So we're not called to live perfect lives. We're called to slowly move away from the old nature towards what God wants to do in the new nature and thank God for what Christ has done for us and the Apostle Paul pointing that out to us. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for many things and every day I give you thanks for <laughs> this new covenant. Wow, where would we be without your Son, Jesus Christ? And every day I give you thanks for my eternal baptismal gift box that includes all the things we need uh, to become more the people you want us to be. And every day I give you thanks for all that you've blessed me with, things that I normally take for granted. And every day I lift up my life to you, knowing full well that I'm a sinner, I'm broken, but yet you are always there to forgive me and lift me up and help me move along. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. You're on. Let us confess our faith as found in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty,